Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we are having a look at an unusual piece of vintage firefighting equipment. This is called a fire grenade, and this would have been a fairly common sight in households, offices, and industrial buildings from around the 1880s into the 1930s. Now, this is a very simple device. It's just a sealed glass globe filled with liquid, and as the name implies, you are supposed to use this by hurling it at the base of a fire, whereupon the globe would smash, releasing the liquid and hopefully putting out the flames. Now, throughout most of history, firefighting has been a very cumbersome affair. You had to very quickly get together a whole group of people in order to form a bucket line, or you had to bring in a hand or steam powered pump with hoses. And by the time you got everything assembled, the fire had usually burned out of control and there's not much you could do about it. And while for many years, buckets of water or sand were kept on hand in various locations in order to fight fires before they grew out of control, the world's first purpose-designed portable fire extinguisher wasn't patented until 1723 by British chemist Ambrose Godfrey. And Godfrey's design consisted of a small wooden cylinder filled with a fire retardant powder and a small gunpowder charge. You were meant to roll this into the fire, whereupon the gunpowder charge would go off, scatter the powder, and hopefully put out the flames. A rather literal interpretation of fight fire with fire. And apparently, in order to demonstrate his invention, Godfrey built a three-story wooden house, which he packed with all sorts of flammable materials like straw and pitch, set it ablaze, and threw in his fire grenade. And apparently it worked quite well, though it was never mass produced or really successfully adopted. But it turns out that Gottfried was way ahead of his time with this invention, as we will shortly see. However, fire grenades as we understand them today really emerged in the 1860s, with the first patent being taken out in the United States in 1863 and they really didn't become popular until around the 1880s. And these early fire grenades consisted of glass bottles of various shapes. Some of them were round, some of them elongated, some of them were more like rolling pins, filled with a mixture of water and salt. And the two different salts were used. One was just ordinary table salt, sodium chloride, and this was meant to stop the grenades from freezing if they were left in an unheated space. The other type of salt commonly used was ammonium chloride, and not only did this serve the same antifreeze purpose as sodium chloride, but when ammonium chloride is heated, it decomposes into ammonia and hydrogen chloride, both of which are heavier than air, and which would blanket the base of the flames, hopefully cutting off the oxygen and snuffing out the fire. And these grenades were actually quite beautiful. They were quite elaborate with these intricate patterns and often the name of the company molded into them. They were made in various different colors and they were really popular as not only safety devices, but also sort of art objects, decorative objects in Victorian homes. And indeed, these were probably more useful as decorative objects than for as firefighting equipment because a lot of them were actually very small. They contained only around a cup or less of water. And, you know, not only would this be very ineffective against any fire, but there were probably easier ways to put out a fire that small, especially if you're dealing with something like a grease fire, throwing a ball of water at it is only going to make the problem worse. Now, by the time we get to the 20th century, the design of fire grenades has been considerably simplified. They lose all of their fancy external moldings and the colored glass, and they become these very utilitarian smooth glass globes. And now the glass itself is sealed rather than the globe being sealed by a cork or sealing wax as in the earlier Victorian designs. And the liquid inside the grenades also changes. So in 1911, the Pyrene Company of Delaware introduced the world's first modern portable fire extinguisher. And this is an example of a Pyrene extinguisher from the 1940s. You can see this is a very simple design. It's a brass tube with a nozzle at one end and a pump handle at the other. And to use this, you would twist the handle and pump it to send a stream of liquid shooting towards the fire. Only this isn't filled with water, but rather a chemical called carbon tetrachloride. 
And carbon tetrachloride, or carbon tet as it's often abbreviated, had a number of applications. It was used as a solvent in paints and coatings. It was used as a refrigerant in early refrigerators. And most famously, it was one of the first chemicals used for dry cleaning. And it turned out that carbon tet had a number of advantages over water when it came to fighting fires. Uh, in the first place, it vaporizes at 76 degrees Celsius, lower temperature than water, and that vapor is heavier than air, meaning that when you spray this at a fire, it will vaporize, and then those vapors will sink down and blanket the fire, displacing the oxygen and hopefully putting the fire out. It's also a lot safer than water to use against electrical and grease fires. And so around the same time, the composition of fire grenades changed to carbon tetrachloride as well. And there were a whole bunch of different brands that you could choose from. These things were sold everywhere and used everywhere. And some of the common brands you'll come across today if you want to start collecting these things include Red Comet of Littleton, Colorado, Red Ball of Salt Lake City, Utah, Sure Stop, which is a product of the Auto Fire Stop Company of Philadelphia, Hardened Star Grenades of London, England, SF Hayward of New York City, and the Larkin Company of Buffalo, New York. And these were unusual in that they contained not a liquid, but rather a powder, and came with a special mechanism that would automatically deploy the grenade and cause it to swing over the fire, scattering the powder over the flames. So the particular fire grenade I have here in my collection is a Fire Chief model, which is manufactured right here in my hometown of Winnipeg, Manitoba. And you can see that it's held in a rather elaborate wall bracket. And this is because this grenade was designed to be deployed in one of two different ways. You could either deploy it manually, just pull it out of its bracket and throw it at the fire, or you could mount the bracket beside a boiler, a furnace, a fireplace, a stove, anywhere where a fire was likely to start. And if the fire got hot enough, it would melt this little lead seal at the bottom, and that would release a spring-loaded trap door that would allow the grenade to fall out of the bracket and onto the fire, hopefully putting it out. So this is actually a primitive form of automatic fire suppression system. Though one wonders if the fire has gotten to the point where it's hot enough to melt a piece of lead, whether this would be really effective against it. So fire grenades continued to be popular into the 1930s and continued to be used to a lesser extent into the 1950s. But after this, they disappeared from the market because it was discovered that, in fact, carbon tetrachloride is horrifically toxic. As I mentioned before, it has a very low vapor pressure, meaning it vaporizes easily and that vapor can be absorbed by the lungs. The liquid can also be easily absorbed through the skin. And once inside the body, it can cause serious damage to the liver, the kidneys, and the nervous system, among other organs. Worse still, at temperatures above 400 degrees Celsius, carbon tetrachloride reacts with water to form phosgene gas, which you may recognize as a chemical weapon used during the First World War. So if you're looking to start collecting fire grenades, I would advise caution. Make sure that they aren't leaking, and if one does crack or break, evacuate the room immediately, and call a hazmat team to come in and clean up the mess, because this could seriously impact your health. Now, as a result of these findings, in 1954, the National Fire Protection Agency banned the use of fire grenades for fire suppression. And finally, in the 1970s, the use of carbon tetrachloride in any application was banned in the United States. Now, interestingly enough, in recent years, fire grenades have started to make something of a comeback. Now, there's a company called Brink that has developed a device called the FIT, Fire Interruption Technology. And this is a landmine-like device that is intended to be activated and slid or thrown into a room with a fire. And inside is a special combustible compound that, when it burns, produces a fine fire retardant mist, a spray of powder, that fills the room and puts out the flames. And online, you can also buy basically what are modern versions of Ambrose Godfrey's 1723 fire grenade. These are little cardboard spheres filled with fire retardant powder and a small gunpowder charge. And when you throw these into the fire, the gunpowder goes off, scatters the powder, and puts out the flames. 
And I've actually gone ahead and ordered one of these things. And when it arrives, I will build a bonfire and I will see exactly how effective it is. So stay tuned for that one. That's going to be a really fun video. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities here on Our Own Devices, where we'll look at yet more fascinating devices from the past, just like this one. Until then, I'm Jeanne Messier. Have a great day.